The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. On this week's Court TV podcast, we're looking at the testimony that has occurred so far in the killing of Molly Tibbetts trial. Did the prosecution successfully defend the tactics police used to get a confession from Christian Rivera? Did the defense create some reasonable doubt by pointing out other suspects? Court TV anchor Michael Ayala joins me to break it all down. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinnie Politan. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for listening and downloading the podcast. Uh, today, we're going to focus on a trial that uh, we cover on Court TV, the television network with our gavel-to-gavel coverage, cameras inside the courtroom. And it's the murder of a young woman named Molly Tibbetts. She was a college student who, during summer break, uh, was going for a jog one day. She disappeared. There was a search. And after a month, her body was recovered dead in a cornfield. And now we're covering the trial of the man accused of the murder. His name is Christian Bahena Rivera. He is um, about the same age. They're both uh, young people in their early 20s. And this is a case that involves a confession. It absolutely does. It's a, it's a big part of the prosecution's case. They have other evidence, but um, much of, of the way they solved this case was by speaking with the defendant, Christian Rivera, and things that he told prosecutors and things that he told investigators helped them solve the case. And they're using some of that evidence against him at, at trial. And I say some of that evidence because all of it didn't get in because of a Miranda problem. Uh, he was not read his uh, rights uh, initially. So some of the statements that he made were suppressed, were not allowed in front of the jury, but others have been, and the jury has heard this type of evidence, confession evidence, extremely powerful when you're talking about a murder case. But what the defense is doing here is, is their position has really been to attack this confession as being coerced slash false confession. Okay. And, and we've seen this before and false confessions are, are for real. We've seen them on court TV. Any of you who saw the trial of Skylar Richardson, a young woman accused of murdering her newborn child, she confessed to burning the baby, confessed to it, but the baby was never burned. And, and what happened was there was a forensic expert who said initially the baby was burned. Investigators got that information they interrogated her, eventually got her to admit to that. But then the forensic expert said, oh, I was wrong. The baby was not burned. So to me, that was a clear case of a false confession. She confessed to a fact that wasn't a fact. But investigators thought it was a fact when they got her to admit it. So we've seen that at Court TV. It's for real. I just don't think it's for real in the case of Christian Rivera. Let me bring in Court TV anchor Michael Ayala, who is with us. Michael, great to have you uh, aboard again, as always. This, this concept of false confessions is, is real, and I know some people are sometimes skeptical about it, but I think in recent years um, it's picked up a lot more credibility, and, and we have seen cases where people have admitted to things that they didn't do. Absolutely, and I, I, I commend you on mentioning the Skylar Richardson case because I can't think of anything more egregious that someone could... Uh, um, confess to um, burning of a baby, your own baby, and they were able to get her to say something like that um, using various tactics. Now, again, as you said, false confessions are very real. There was a time probably, I would say 10, 15 years ago, maybe a little further back where people did not believe. And, and I'll tell you what, I was in that camp for a long time, Benny, where how could someone there was no one I said to myself that could ever make me uh, uh, confess to something I didn't do. No way. But then we all lived through the Central Park Four in New York and saw what happened there. Um, cases after cases we've seen, Innocence Project, false confessions. And there are certain hallmarks of those false confessions that you see over and over again. And you talked about the Skylar Richardson case. Um, these things happen. Uh, police put people in very difficult situations. The dynamic between folks 
Uh, dealing with police is very, very difficult to navigate for people who are not used to navigating that situation. So yes, Vinny, these things are and can be real. Right, which is exactly why they should be tested and and they should be um, looked at very closely, uh, number one, by DAs, right? Because they're the first level of, of scrutiny here. But then eventually, if it goes to trial, judges should look at it and, and the jury should look at it. And it's it's not a given. A confession is not a given piece of evidence that you can rely upon a thousand percent. You just can't. It's like any other piece of evidence that it has to pass scrutiny. And, and for me, um, the, the more troubling confessions, obviously, are the ones that aren't recorded um, that you don't see because if a jury can see it, then the jury can evaluate their own um, uh, in their own way, the assessment of, of the tactics that were used. But let's now get to this case of Christian Rivera, because to me, this is a little different, right? Uh, and I understand what the defense is trying to do. They are trying to do whatever they can, but the, the bottom line here is coerced confession versus false confession coerced versus false and 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 to me coerce confession doesn't necessarily equal false confession you can coerce someone into confessing to something that they actually did but if it's false then to me that is where you throw it out that's where you have problems and and the reason i have a problem here with the argument that this in fact could be a false confession uh really comes down to the part of the confession where the defendant leads investigators to the body of Molly Tibbetts because she's missing. It, it start, it's a missing persons case, and no one knows where she is. But apparently Christian Rivera does. Take a listen. Did you ever then press him then on more details? How did you go about doing that? Yes, so um, I went to ask him, Mr. Rivera, please just let me know. Give me more details how she got into the car. What happened to her? What did you do to her? Um, he, his answer was, I brought you here, didn't I? Um, so that means that I did it. I don't remember how I did it. I brought you here. And to me, that's such a big part of this case, Michael, because Molly Tibbetts was a missing person. No one knew where she was. Christian Rivera brought investigators to her body. Yeah, I mean, I understand that that's uh, seemingly a very strong piece of evidence, but I want to seemingly. Well, let me let me let me begin first by saying when you look at these things as a defense attorney, you become a little bit cynical. And, and this goes back to what you were talking about in terms of you, know, you have to test every piece of the state's evidence, including this confession. So uh, I, I want to preface what we're going to talk about now by saying that is merely what I'm doing. I'm looking at it as I would as a defense attorney representing this man. And I want to really make sure that this confession is proper. And what I'll say is, I mean, you make a statement that I'm not necessarily sure, sure is true. You said no one knew where Molly Tibbetts' body was. I'm not sure how you can make that statement. What if this, this body was buried in a cornfield or buried under some corn stalks in a cornfield? I submit to you, it's very possible a lot of people knew where the body was. And so, for instance, this was a farm or this was a cornfield where uh, a lot of illegal immigrants or immigrants work. I don't know, legal or illegal. And, and I submit to you that she was missing for a month. Uh, there was serious decomposition. I'm sure there were some terrible smells coming from that area. I would not be surprised if a lot of folks in the Mexican and immigrant community knew where that body was. And they had talked amongst each other. They're very close. They, they hang out together. They're a very small group in a town that is very, you know, there are very small, small numbers. And, and I would not be surprised if they all talked to each other and all of them knew that there was this body sitting out there. But they didn't want to say anything to authorities because speaking to authorities was not something you did under those types of circumstances, being an immigrant or even a legal or illegal immigrant. So him knowing where the body was can be explained that way. And I can tell you this, at one point he leads them somewhere, he, he, he's wrong, then he leads them someplace else and he's right. So it's very possible that he knew where the body was, had heard about this body being out there, and something had happened in a conversation back at the station house where he was like, he realized, he was going to be deported at some point, and maybe he asked Moreno for help. And Moreno said to him, you help me, and I'll be able to help you, which is something under Iowa law they're not really supposed to be able to do. But apparently, 
There are transcripts that suggest he said that. She said she didn't mean that. There was some testimony to that effect. But at the end of the day, he led her to the body. And perhaps in his mind, that was going to allow him to maybe not be deported and allow him to stay in the country. But it turned out uh, very differently for him. Again, and I preface this by saying, this is a theory that I might have as a defense attorney representing him. I'm not saying that's what happened, but it's possible. Well, I, I, I disagree that it's possible here because of other facts in, in the case uh, that have come out, in, in, including this statement. Let's take a listen. What is the next thing that Christian Rivera told you that he remembers uh, while he was on this road with Molly Tibbetts? So once Mr. Rivera told me that he got um, angry and he remembered them starting fighting, he stated that usually when he became, becomes angry or when he gets mad, he blocks out. So the next thing that he told me was that um, he remember him driving and looking down into his legs and finding the earbuds that belonged to Molly, and that is when he remembered that he had Molly in the back of his vehicle in the trunk. Okay, so an admission that she's in the trunk of his car and her DNA is in the trunk of his car. That's why, I like, coerced confession, I understand, right? The tactics they use, they get you to confess. That's part of, of, of their job. Um, but false, the, the, the DNA is in, the, he leads them to the body. The DNA is in the trunk of the car that he's driving. And, and that's the same car that we see stalking Molly Tibbetts on video, which is, which is how they initially tracked him down. That's why I'm, I'm wondering, you know, would anyone think this is a false confession? Uh, this guy falsely confesses after, uh, you know, circling the block, stalking Molly Tibbetts, admitting that he did it, her DNA in the trunk, leading her to the body. There, there, to me, there's too many other facts that corroborate his confession that make it not false. Yeah, and, and again, um, I think that's probably how the jury's going to see it. But when I look at it, I see a couple of problems. Number one, we say that that's what he said. Well, we don't know that's what he said, because guess what? The actual confession was not recorded. It was written not by the defendant himself, but written by the by the investigators. So that's one telltale sign you'll see often in cases where there's a false confession. Secondly, at that time, they weren't 100 percent sure they did not have the murder weapon. So they weren't 100 percent sure how she died. There were a couple of conflicting thoughts about how she had died. So he conveniently, quote unquote, blacks out for the specifics of the murder. The whole time he's being questioned, his car is within the um, uh, control, dominion and control of the police. Now, again, looking at it with a cynical eye, they have a guy who they believe did it. Uh, the climate of the times is one where illegal, illegal immigrants are being looked very negatively upon. Um, there are a lot of people within uh, police departments across the country that would really have no problem saying, hey, you know what? I know this guy did it. There's no question in my mind this guy did it. How can we shore this thing up? And they go and shore it up with a couple of swabs of blood. OK, and what I'm saying to you is, again, this is not necessarily my view. This is the, an, an alternate view, one that you have to take if you're challenging the evidence in this case, because when you look at the type of crime it was, and all the blood that would have been associated with this crime, not only when he was actually committing the act, if he committed it, but also when she was in the trunk, the amount of blood they found was not necessarily consistent with that, nor was there a lot of blood found on him, nor was his DNA found on her. It was also a crime that required a tremendous amount of anger. And if you notice in the confession, they manufacture the anger. The anger is manufactured by the fact that, oh, she didn't want to talk to him and said she was going to call police. So that's why he got angry, because they knew that the person who killed her had to be extremely angry at her, which points to a lot of other people. And they didn't do a very thorough job in excluding a lot of other people who could have been responsible for this crime. They just didn't. And the defense has done a good job of bringing that out again. Do I think it's going to be enough? Absolutely not. It's going to be very difficult for a jury to walk away from the evidence in this case. But if I look at this thing truly cynically and I look at it and want to challenge it, these are the ways I'm challenged. And then the question becomes, is that 
reasonable doubt? Like, is that reasonable that Pamela Romero, a, a Mexican immigrant herself, would want to um, frame this guy and perjure herself and commit crimes to make sure he gets he gets well, what happened to Pamela Romero right after uh, this? she's gone. She's gone. She left the force right after this. She right. left the force. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, you got you got to believe that there's a massive conspiracy. No, not to massive. Plant it's, it only takes about four or five people. Uh, That's four or five uh, people committing crimes. Committing, committing crimes, crimes. That, but the crimes that are and 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 then you say it like it's never happened before, right? You know, I mean, we've seen it time and time again. This is not this is not unusual anymore. This is not unusual. These are people who truly believe that they are the world's His greatest car. authorities. Right. They have a tremendous amount of respect for authority her. and they believe that they are it. And so if they believe that someone's guilty, they have they don't see it as a crime when they say, hey, let's just shore this thing up. There. Let's drop a clip. Let's do a swab on the front of the back of the of the fender there so we can just make sure this guy doesn't walk away, et cetera, et cetera. These things, they happen. Vinny. And again, I just want to keep pointing out they happen. I'm not saying that's what happened here. Right. I'm, saying well, I'm, I'm talking about what this, happened what here and what's reasonable under the circumstances. And, and then you get back to the video of his car. It's his car that is circling and stalking her at the time that she disappeared. Uh, I mean, to me, you put all the, the little pe- the little pieces together. They all fit perfectly there's was nothing she, was that doesn't she running fit. in circles i'm still i'm a little confused about that video part maybe you can explain it to me. he was circling around her he's in a car she's running so he can catch up to her pretty easily all right all right michael is skeptical hey when we come back uh and michael brought this up and it's another uh big part of the case other strange behavior by other people now do I want to use the word uh, suspects? I, I don't know. I mean, there were a bunch of people, we've talked about this on the podcast before, who've done suspicious things that should be investigated, um, but are they actual legitimate suspects in the case? And is there a an argument to make that they are reasonable suspects that could have, there's a reasonable argument to make that they actually committed the crime? We'll talk about that when we come back. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. They indicated that uh, Ron Pexa had been and it, a person who had harmed children and women in the past. Yes, that's what this how this reads. Yes. Okay. Um, this tip that received on August one, two thousand eighteen, also indicated that Ron Pex's home had a hidden room. Right. Yeah, yes. I'm gonna object. This is not relevant. Overruled. Go ahead. Yes, the the report here says there is a hidden room. And that room concealed edged weapons, right? Judge yeah. again, object to relevance. Yes, that's what it says. And that Mr. Pexa had threatened women, specifically his ex-wife, with death and burial, right? Objection to hearsay and relevance. Sustained on that hearsay. All right, this is part of what the defense is doing in the case against Christian Rivera, the man accused of murdering Molly Tibbetts in Iowa. There are a lot of other people um, on the radar uh, who engaged in some strange behavior, perhaps suspicious behavior, people that should be looked at. And but before our break, Michael Ayala, who's still with me, Court TV anchor, um, said that the investigators didn't do a good job. They didn't do a, a, a good job of investigating these other folks. I mean, Michael, here's where I got to disagree with you. I mean, they dug up people. I mean, it was amazing the, the number of suspects who were investigated and looked really suspicious and might have been arrested in the first half hour of an episode of Law and & Order and might have been charged. Um, 
But to me, that's a sign of a thorough investigation that all these uh, potential suspicious people were uncovered, that they did not have tunnel vision, that they looked everywhere from a kid who wiped his phone, who whose brother worked with uh, the boyfriend to the boyfriend himself, to uh, the guy who ditched his car 20 miles away to go meet some woman he met on the Internet in Indiana and had a red stain in the back seat of the car that he ditched um, to the local local farmer slash stalker who lived very close to where uh, Molly Tibbetts body was ultimately found. They were all investigated, Michael. They were all uncovered and they and they were all cleared. Yeah, I think I think early on they did. But what one of the things that I believe came out uh, during testimony was that um, there were uh, a number of people that they did not take DNA from. Um, and there were a number of instances where they found DNA they could not identify. And so there were questions as to whether they could eliminate those people with, of course, what we know to be right now, the strongest evidence you could have is DNA. They did not pursue that for a number of people. But when they went to the farm and they took DNA from all 12 employees, they're all Latinos. Um, So a lot of people see that as being sort of this selective prosecution. And then once they had someone with any kind of nexus at all to the victim, who was Latino, then they zeroed in and that was that. They had their man. Um, so that was sort of the suggestion there. Um, so I think what the defense is doing is they're trying to suggest that um, there were not, they weren't as thorough as they could have been with some of these suspects um, to eliminate them because they very easily could eliminate them again with the, with the strongest evidence they have, which is DNA. Um, and they could have taken these other DNA things that they found not in the car, they found um, on, 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 on cups and utensils in the house where Molly Tibbetts stayed. It was unidentifiable DNA. So again, the defense is using that to suggest um, that they could have been a little bit more thorough. Uh, but suddenly when Latinos were involved, they were extremely thorough. So that's sort of a suggestion that they're making. Yeah, I think that suggestion is is not not valid. And again, you can we can debate the reasonableness right. of it. Again, I'm not sure this is going to win. This, as a matter of fact, I know this won't win the day with the jury. But this is where the defense is going with it, and it's you know, I think it's those are fair arguments. If they certainly don't rise to the level level of reasonable for some people, I think they're fair arguments. And from my perspective, I mean, if, if you want to say that these cops are racist somehow, if you're making that indication, well, look at the people that they investigated before they found Christian Rivera. And how did they find Christian Rivera? It had nothing to do with the color of his skin, had to do with the color of his car and, and, the, and the chrome bumpers. No, no question. It, it really becomes a question of what people believe people are capable of. And that goes to the question of, let's say, the DNA. So if I question a Caucasian person, you know, I'm being a little bit more respectful of their rights. I'm not taking their DNA. I'm looking into some of the things they say, et cetera, et cetera. It may go to in the way that I approach the investigation into an individual who I don't maybe believe is capable of this. Like you see the young guy take the stand, her boyfriend, um, uh, Dalton, takes the stand. Um, you look at him and you're like, oh, okay, he says he didn't do it. So I'm not as focused on him. But the minute I get my eyes on an illegal immigrant, let's remember the tenor of the times, it was build a wall, right? It was Donald Trump, it was illegal aliens, uh, all criminals. Uh, He even used this case, both Pence and Trump mentioned this case. And matter of fact, the family was like, look, don't don't use our family in this case for political purposes. Um, We're talking about this case to to hammer home the point that illegals, this is before he's convicted, um, that illegals are criminals and, and dangerous. So you got to remember the tenor of the times and, and, and illegals were, you know, that was a feather in your cap for law enforcement. So, again, there's a lot of different different factors playing in. doesn't mean they're directly racist, but there's a lot going on there in the tenor of the times. Yeah. Well, and again, to me, it gets back to the facts and, and, and the, the facts in the case uh, go one way. And I think the prosecutor did a really good job on the redirect of his case agent after the defense tried to bring up all these other people and and tried to indicate to this jury or suggest to this jury that investigators didn't do their job and had blinders on. Take a listen. I thought this was a great finish by the prosecutor. Were you able to develop any evidence that any of the men raised here by Mr. Freeze were angry with Molly Tibbetts in any way? No.
Were you able to develop any information from any of the men, including Dalton Jack, uh, any information from any of those men that they made admissions that Molly Tibbetts was in the trunk of their car? No, just Christian Rivera is the only one that told us that. And that's a, a, a short piece of what was um, a really great finish uh, on the on the redirect of that witness, pointing it out. And he got a little more animated later on. But to me, that's that's what cases should come down to. It seems like the defense is trying to make turn this into race and politics and everything else, whereas the prosecutor's doing a great job of focusing on the facts. Well, you know, Vinny, you know, it just frustrates me when people say that. You know, we don't turn or defense attorneys don't turn anything. They take the facts just like you're talking about. We weren't the ones or the defendants attorneys weren't the ones that went out and only took DNA from Latinos. OK, they weren't the ones. So they're not they're playing the cards and the deck that they were dealt. So they didn't they're not injecting race races in it, period, the end. And I can tell you this. I'm not really in agreement with the testimony. It came out that Dalton Jack was upset at um, Molly Tibbetts because she had changed her mind about moving in together with. Him. He was upset at her for that. It came out on cross-examination. So when this guy testifies that he came up with no evidence that anybody was upset at Molly Tibbetts, he's wrong, period. So you can take it what you want. You can call facts, whatever you want to call facts. But everybody's got their own version of the facts. OK, am I wrong about that? Did Dolan Jock not say that he was upset about the fact that they had plans to move in together and she had changed her mind? Wouldn't that upset you? Uh, it depends. <laughs> But that's another story for another day. When I talk about the facts, to me, the facts are the videotape of the car, the DNA in the trunk, the confession. No, no, that's it. That's all you got. You got a videotape of a car going back and <laughs> all forth. All I got is a videotape, got... DNA, and a confession. Thank no, you. No, 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 not the confession. I don't, uh, I'm not including the confession. You got, you, got the, you got the car going back and forth, and then you got some tiny bit of blood swabs in a, in a crime that was full of blood. You got a little bit of blood, right? If he did what they said he did, there would have been blood all over him, Vinny. There would have been blood all over the car, not only in the trunk, but in the car where he was sitting down, et cetera, et cetera. But he had the presence of mind while he was blacked out to actually take his shirt off because he was afraid of the blood. Things don't make sense. And this is what I'm saying. The defense is questioning these things. At the end of the day, Again, I don't think it's going to be enough for this jury to find him not guilty, but there are issues here, Vinny. There are certainly issues. Oh, there are always issues in every case. And as a former prosecutor, I know you've got to prove everything beyond a reasonable doubt, and you've got to eliminate uh, any of those reasonable explanations that might be out there. But if I'm a prosecutor, I absolutely love this case. I, I love the facts. And I and, and really think the defense is... Um, and they're, they're making arguments that they have to that they have to make. But but to me, it, the credibility of the arguments is to me is is a stretch and it's beyond a stretch. And um, I don't think it convinces a jury. And, and I don't I don't think it convinces anyone. I don't think it convinces Christian Rivera. I mean, as he sits there with his headphones on, I don't I, I don't know. He did, And the other thing I look at this guy, he doesn't look like a guy who's been falsely uh, accused. And, and I know See, now that's unfair, Vinny. Come no, it's on, not. Man. It's not unfair because I've seen people falsely accused. All right. And I go back to this story. This is a, a, a quick story. It'll just take 10 seconds or so. I was at the prosecutor's office and we had a video of a, of a, of a man who was seen stealing drugs from a, a closet. The guy was a pharmacist and he was indicted. He comes in to look at the video. The guy looks at the video and and starts screaming at my colleague. That's not me. <laughs> and drops F-bombs and storms out of the office. And at that point, I said, all right, that's someone who's been falsely accused. That, that's, that's the way they would react. Yeah, that, you know? that, that's a that's difficult the way they thing. Would react. It's just like I'm saying, saying, none of it's just Christian like saying Vinny, I always have an issue with when we compare how people respond to things. Um, uh, it's just like, you know, talking about, well, he's not grieving in a way that you would think someone who's who, Grieving. Right, that's like but Rabbi Newlander. Grieves. Rabbi Newlander everyone, comes home, finds his wife bludgeoned to death. Everyone grieves differently. Everyone processes that she's bludgeoned to guy, death in their house. Is, not a spot this is of a guy, blood on the rabbi's this suit. Is a guy, not a spot of blood. There's a guy that takes the cops to a scene, and he says, "I brought you here. I, that I must have done it." I mean, 
Come on, Vinny. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's unfair. That's like Jordy Arias. Jordy Arias got lost in the responding fog. to being falsely accused. I, I, can, I okay, let me Killers give you a quick black story. Out all let me the give time. you a quick story. Go ahead. Covered a case in Queens back when I used to work at Court TV originally, Court TV Classic. And um, the guy was, I, I said throughout, this case stinks. This case stinks. They had a jailhouse informant and they had a, a guy in a wheelchair who could barely see identifying him as the guy who climbed in a window and committed a crime inside the house. None of them saw the crime. They just saw him climbing a window, said it wasn't him, said it wasn't him. And, you know, he took it. He just, he didn't freak out, didn't do anything. I said, this is not a good case. 18 years later, and I still feel guilty about this to this day. I should do some more, done more for this kid. He was found to have been not guilty that these, uh, these other guys had lied on the stand. So you just never know how someone's going to respond. Hey, I never, I never trust those, those, those jailhouse informants. I say the, the, everything they say no, has got to be corroborated. I'm talking, more, I'm talking more about how this guy who was found guilty right, was how reacting reacted. to the situation. How we, how we he wasn't freaking out. He was kind of resigned to his situation, you know, and started you. writing letters. He took a different approach, started writing letters, and eventually got someone's attention, and uh, he was free 18 years later. Yeah. So again, I, just to say, you you can't judge people on how they react. I judge people every day. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Ayala, always great to have you on the program, folks. Uh, make sure you watch Michael's show every night, six to eight. Then you then you stay for the after party, which is my show from <laughs> eight to eleven. Michael, thank yes, you so sir. much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Vinny. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. All right. When we come back, and, and I've been saying this, and you've, you've heard my tone throughout the podcast, you know, the, the defense is, is off base here. But when we come back, I'll tell you why we just can't get mad at them. Renowned journalist Ashley Benfield takes you behind the scenes of the most compelling cases in history. This is the new chapter in true crime. Judgment with Ashley Benfield. All new episodes Sunday nights at 8 on Court TV. I say it all the time. A trial is a search for the truth. That's what it's about. Right. You, you bring in a jury and their job is to is to find the facts and, and, and to find the truth of what happened. That's the ultimate purpose. That's our system of justice is based based upon truth, truth and justice for all. Right. The only way we get justice is through the truth. And, and the prosecution, which I am a former prosecutor, is ethically tied to that. OK. Ethically, prosecutors can only seek the truth can only seek justice. It's not about winning a case against a defendant or getting an indictment against a defendant. No, it's about getting the truth out, uncovering the truth, and that's where justice uh, resides, okay? That does not mean prosecutors, there aren't bad prosecutors who might do something unethical or there are prosecutors who are wrong, believe they're right and are wrong, right? But you have to understand that their job is, is to get it right and to get to the truth. It's not about how many convictions you get. Now, for the defense and the defense attorneys, who in, in, in this case involving Christian Rivera, I've said and what they're arguing is a stretch. I don't like the fact that they're trying to make this about race and about politics, and they're throwing uh, uh, you know, spaghetti against the wall to see if something sticks, throwing, pointing the finger at the boyfriend, pointing the finger at the, the, the local pedophile, pointing the finger at another guy, at another guy, and saying investigators didn't do anything, and, and saying that, oh, yeah, they're pointing the finger everywhere, okay? But you can't get mad at them. And, and, and the reason is, is that defense attorneys are not ethically tied to the truth, and that's a great difference that I, I bring out here a lot on the podcast because it's something that a lot of people uh, don't think about or, or don't understand or, or have never spent the time to wonder about. Their ethical obligation is to their client and is to do whatever you can that's in the best interest of the person who's accused of the crime. So I'm not going to get mad at the defense attorneys in the Christian Rivera case for doing their jobs because only if they do their jobs... Will the truth come out? Why do I say that? Because they've got to test and, and, and really um, challenge the evidence in every single case. Every case. And, and the cases where you have the biggest 
Uh, miscarriages of justice is where you don't have defense attorneys doing their job and not challenging the evidence. Take a look back at some of these cases where, where uh, convictions have been overturned and you'll see really bad defense attorneys. Really bad. And they're not doing their job. And, and as a result, justice isn't done. Well, well, while it's the prosecution's role to seek justice, seek the truth, it's the defense's job to do everything uh, uh, for the accused, which is to challenge that. And only if it is challenged can the jury actually come to a proper conclusion. More times than not. And I would say 999,000 times out of, you know, a million, whatever it is. I'm not good at math right now. The, this is how the system has to work. So don't take it personally against the defense attorneys with the arguments they make, because if they don't make these arguments, the, the evidence is not challenged, the system becomes a rubber stamp, and then you get wrongful convictions, which is the worst outcome possible. And that's the way the framers set it up. You should have guilty people going free before innocent people ever get locked up and convicted. So that's how it works. That's why I don't get mad at them, but I won't, I won't let it just slide by. I will challenge them every, every chance I have if they're making an argument that I think is out of bounds. And I'll also remind you of how this system works. And I, and I challenge when prosecutors are not doing their ethical job, I go after them. And I go after defense attorneys when they don't do their job. I also go after them when they are doing their job. But that's me just being the, the former prosecutor. It's in my blood. But I, I understand and appreciate what they have to do. That's the foundation that our system is built on. And if you don't have great criminal defense attorneys doing anything and everything they can to defend their clients... The system falls and ultimately justice will not be done because the truth will not come out during the trial. Speaking of trials, the place to watch them, Court TV, your front row seat to justice um, all day long, gavel to gavel coverage of big trials across the country. Um, then at night from 8 to 11, uh, I bring you all the big moments from inside the courtroom during the day and all the other legal stories that are happening out there, unsolved cases. Uh, and, and crimes and mysteries that, that are happening, as well as the trials that are taking place across the country. Now, if you have a, a digital antenna, please rescan it because uh, you've got to do that. Every once in a while, you've got to rescan your digital antenna to make sure you're getting all the channels that are out there, including Court TV. Um, check the show notes, folks. We have lots of links uh, and information about the Molly Tibbetts case um, that you can uh, take a look at. And uh, that's it for me. You know, we'll be back next week with another great podcast, guaranteed. I'm Vinny Politan. Have a, have a great week, and don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.